Today, Ukrainian forces initiated a high-stakes, long-range strike operation targeting Russia's primary unmanned aerial vehicle, UAV production facility in Alabuga. This facility is strategically critical, reportedly producing approximately 500 Shahed-type loitering munitions per month, assets directly utilized in persistent attacks against Ukrainian critical infrastructure. The operation employed a single AN-196 Liuti long-range attack drone, tasked with a one-way kinetic mission over 1,000 kilometers deep into Russian territory. The initial phase of the operation underscored the challenge of navigating friendly airspace under combat conditions during active combat. At 4.15 a.m., the AN-196 navigated through Ukrainian air defense sectors without standard identification friend or foe, IFF transponders, or active data links. This operational silence was necessary to prevent Russian electronic intelligence from detecting the launch, but it presented an immediate risk of friendly fire. Minutes after takeoff, the drone entered the engagement envelope of a Ukrainian Zhepard self-propelled anti-aircraft gun, SPAY-G. The Zhepard search radar immediately acquired the contact at a range of 8 kilometers. The system's fire control computer, recognizing a flight profile similar to Russian-operated hardware, calculated a 94% intercept probability. The Gepard, armed with twin 35mm Oerlikon cannons, capable firing 1,100 rounds per minute of A-head tungsten ammunition, is designed to shred such airframes instantly. However, engagement was withheld due to a highly specific, pre-arranged safe passage window. Orders issued specified that between 4.20 a.m. and 4.30 a.m., no aerial targets matching the prearranged corridor parameters, 150 m altitude, 150 Kembler H, were to be engaged. At 4.20 a.m., the AN-196 entered the prearranged corridor, approximately 150 m altitude and 150 Kembler H, matching the authorized transit parameters. This extreme level of synchronization allowed the asset to clear friendly defensive lines safely while maintaining a low observable profile. At precisely 6.30 a.m., the sophisticated AN-196 aerial vehicle breached Russian sovereign airspace, an event that immediately sent ripples through the nation's air defense network. The initial cryptic anomaly reports originated from the Bryansk Sector Command, a critical hub for regional aerial surveillance. These reports, while not yet fully deciphered, indicated an unusual and unauthorized intrusion. Minutes later, Russian observation posts visually confirmed, strategically positioned along the border, visually confirmed the presence of a slow-moving unmanned aerial vehicle, UAV. Their observations painted a clear picture. The drone was maintaining a remarkably low altitude of just 50 meters, effectively utilizing ground clutter for concealment. Its unwavering trajectory of 0 087 degrees suggested a deliberate, predetermined flight path deep into Russian territory. The most alarming observation was the AN-196's total lack of response to standard electronic challenges. Repeated attempts to establish contact, identify its origin, and compel it to alter course through conventional radio frequencies and transponder pings were met with silence. This defiance suggested a highly advanced and potentially hostile platform designed to evade detection and ignore established protocols, raising serious questions about its purpose and intent. The incident immediately escalated from a mere anomaly to a grave national security concern, triggering a heightened state of alert across the Russian air defense system. In response, Russian commanders deployed the Pol-21 Electronic Warfare EW system to grid reference 445892. The Pol-21 is a potent area denial asset designed to create a 20-kilometer dead zone for satellite navigation. Its 15-meter mast broadcasts powerful noise on GPS frequencies, operational reports describe kilowatt class output, producing a signal orders of magnitude stronger than genuine satellite signals. At 6.34 a.m., the AN-196 entered the jammed zone. Russian operators anticipated a standard failure sequence, three seconds for receiver overwhelm, five seconds for signal loss recognition, and 10 seconds before the drone entered its lost link protocol, usually a predetermined circle or return to home maneuver. When jamming failed to deter the craft, operators switched to spoofing mode, broadcasting false GPS coordinates designed to convince the drone's navigation computer it was 500 kilometers off course. 
course, theoretically forcing it to turn and exhaust its fuel. The AN-196 ignored both jamming and spoofing. Post-operational analysis indicates the airframe used an optical scene-matching navigation system, a DSMAC-like visual waypoint tracker, letting it navigate by landmarks instead of GPS. Instead of relying on easily jammed satellite signal, the drone was navigating autonomously by comparing real-time optical input with pre-loaded terrain maps. It utilized distinct, unchangeable landmarks, following the M3 highway for 10 kilometers, identifying a specific S-curve near Seltso, and tracking high-voltage power lines to a specific three-span bridge crossing. By rendering $8 million Russian EW assets tactically useless, the drone continued its advance unchallenged by electronic means. At 9.45 a.m., the drone approached the highly defended airspace around Nizhny Novgorod, defended by S-400 long-range surface-to-air missile batteries. The S-400's 92N6E Gravestone Engagement Radar, capable of detecting fighter-sized targets at 250 kilometers, locked onto the AN-196. However, radar physics severely degraded to the S-400's effectiveness against this specific threat. While a fighter jet might have a radar cross-section (RCS) of 3 square meters, the AN-196 presents approximately 0.5 square meters. Radar detection falls off rapidly for much smaller targets, roughly following a fourth route relationship. So the N196's small radar cross-section reduced the S400's effective detection from about 250 kilometers to roughly 107 kilometers, leaving operators with far less reaction time. Human factors and doctrine also reduced response effectiveness. The contact occurred at 9.45 a.m., just 15 minutes before the 10 a.m. shift change, a recognized period of reduced vigilance. Furthermore, the AN196 was flying at 50 meters to utilize Earth's curvature and ground clutter as shielding. Crucially, the drone exploited a geometric flaw within Russia's layered air defense network. While S-400 missiles, $2 million each, were doctrinally reserved for high-value, high-altitude targets, the close-in defense, the Pantsir S-1 system, could not engage. At a range of 4 kilometers and an altitude of just 50 meters, the required engagement angle was minus 7 degrees. The Pantsir's 30mm autocannons were mechanically limited to a maximum depression of minus 5 degrees. The drone literally flew underneath the gun's engagement envelope. It subsequently vanished into ground clutter on the radar scopes and was dismissed by operators as a false return, or non-threatening reconnaissance asset. By 11.47 a.m., the AN-196 was on final approach to the Alabuga facility. The facility's dedicated counter-UAS, CUAS station, having received earlier warnings, was fully active. They employed the Repellent-1 system, designed specifically to counter drone threats by focusing 500 watts of electromagnetic energy into a tight 30-degree cone to sever command links. Russian operators cycled through over 10,000 known command protocols, including Turkish, NATO, and commercial override codes, in an attempt to hijack the drone's flight computer. When this failed, they initiated frequency hopping attacks, and finally, a full barrage jamming assault, utilizing 14 simultaneous jammers covering the 100 MHz to 6 GHz spectrum. These sophisticated countermeasures failed due to a zero-trust hardware configuration employed by Ukrainian engineers for this specific mission. The AN-196 had been physically stripped of all radio frequency RF reception capabilities. Sensor balls, satellite communication domes, antenna arrays, and radio modules had been removed, with their connection ports cut and capped. The flight computers were further hardened inside aluminum Faraday cages. There was simply no electronic pathway for the Russian jamming energy to enter the system. It was effectively an autonomous, analog kinetic weapon during its terminal phase. At 11.52 a.m., the AN-196 struck the target. Traveling at 180 kilometers per H, the 700 kilogram aircraft easily sheared through the anti-drone steel mesh protecting the facility, which was only rated to stop lightweight quadcopters. The drone's warhead, utilizing a thermite mixture, detonated inside the main storage warehouse. The resulting chemical reaction produced temperatures exceeding 2,500 degrees Celsius, instantly igniting the stored Shahed drones. 
the tightly packed munitions created a catastrophic cascading failure. Within 0.3 seconds of impact, initial fuel stores ruptured. The subsequent vapor expansion created massive overpressure within the enclosed structure. By 11.53 a.m., the entire facility was engulfed, with the fireball reaching an altitude of 800 meters. Initial assessments estimate the loss of roughly 5,500 Shahed munitions, about six months of production. The estimated financial damage exceeds $500 million in lost inventory alone, not including the destruction of the physical plant. This operation successfully demonstrated that highly sophisticated, network-dependent air defenses can be defeated by autonomously guided systems that are physically air-gapped from external manipulation. This deep strike operation has resulted in a significant, albeit likely temporary, disruption to Russian operational logistics in the drone warfare sector. The destruction of 5,500 loitering munitions will likely reduce the intensity of aerial attacks on Ukrainian infrastructure in the coming months, while Russia replenishes this specific stockpile. The operation forces a reassessment of deep defense postures, potentially drawing critical air defense assets away from front lines. 